that's uh, very well. All right, fantastic. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here um, again. So this is session number seven of our architect engineering construction experience. And here are ways to connect with the whole program. So you can do it on Bulls Connect, join it as design and construction, that group, or uh, just Google USF AEC experience and you'll get us there. Quick, there we go. So reminder, there is, if you wanna go out on the job site, you can go out on the job site virtually anytime you want and then look at how the job is progressing. We've got those links and if you again, go to AEC Connect or AEC Experience, um, you can just jump into those links immediately. So what we're talking about today is the building envelope. So that is everything, that's the roof, that's the walls, the windows, the foundation, underground. You put all of those together and that's the what's called the exterior skin or the exterior envelope. Today we have got a bunch of poles, we've got a bunch of speakers, so we're gonna be going really quickly as today. So I think Atsuko sent you the the poll everywhere, or you can text my name, Stephen Lafferty, 580. I don't know where the 580 came from, but, and then at 22333. If you want to do that by text, by phone, on the, on the app. So today we've got Carrie Parker over here. I think you've seen Carrie before, maybe online, maybe in person, but she is our architect, project manager, senior architect uh, for Canon Design. She serves as a project manager for that project. And she's been a student life planner on lots of other projects in higher education, complex projects. I'm not gonna go through everybody because we're running a little bit behind time already, but we've got David P. Prislaska. Prislaska, all right, or something like that anyway. I apologize. Uh, from Canon Design, he's the project architect on the project. So Carrie gets the credit, but David does all the work. <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, they both work really hard. We have online, we have Vanessa Hostick. She is with HOK Architects. Uh, she is their senior associate and sustainability leader. And she has done the first lead platinum uh, NFL stadium. So hopefully they board of trustees earlier today kind of announced where a stadium might go on campus. So that's kind of exciting. Maybe she can help us with that in the future. You never know, you never know. She's also done the first, the first and the largest lead for homes project outside of North America the largest lead neighborhood, and she is the only licensed BREAM assessor for indoor interior fit out and refurbishment in the US. We've got Marcel Mazalowski here. So Marcel gets a congratulations because he's now president and CEO of the firm Fleischmann Garcia and Mazlowski um, just as of a couple weeks ago. So that's very exciting, congratulations. Originally from Martinique, um, he graduated from USF, so he's another, he's a bull. So glad to have him in person today. Remotely, we have Ed Kwong or Edmund Kwong uh, for Morphosis. He's our project architect on this particular project. Uh, he also worked on a whole bunch of other projects, the Net Zero Lead Platinum Project, Cornell's Cornell Tech's campus on Roosevelt Island. He worked on the Bill and Melinda Gates Hall at Cornell University, the Perot Museum of Nature Science, and the lead designer for Clyde Frazier's Wine and Dine. So I think we have Mike McGrath on the line also, hopefully. We hope so. Uh, Mike McGrath is president of MG McGrath they're the company that's actually installing the metal panels um, on the Honors College. 
So he started sweeping warehouse floors for MG McGrath, went up to apprentice, journeyman, foreman, project manager, vice president of operations, and now he runs the, the whole show. Um, so he has done some great stuff, including one of his current projects is the USF Bank Stadium for the NFL Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Vikings, which is the largest project ever constructed, have ever been constructed in Minnesota. So that's, a, that's pretty exciting. We're excited to have Mike here with us. We have Chris Clater. You guys know Chris, visiting him in person. We've got Eric Verboon. He is the principal director of facade engineering for Walter P. Moore. So Walter P. Moore, you may remember, is our structural engineering group for the engineer. They started a, an enclosure engineering. And Eric has been a lot of, done a lot of great things, but he also teaches enclosure design at a number of universities. And then also with us is Kat Chan who is uh, with Walter P. Moore also. She joined them in 2018, and she comes with a lot of great experience. So got a lot of speakers. Um, we are going to pause in between sessions to give your eyes a rest from rolling back in your head a little bit. Um, but we're going to hit you with a lot of a lot of great information today. So I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Here you go. Can I also ask you to take our pictures? Yep. Like as yes. we lecture. Yes. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Steve. I got a good introduction already. Um, so uh, we prefer to take the route of we're going to quiz you before we tell you in anything. So what do you think? What is the ideal building orientation from a solar standpoint in Tampa, Florida? We'll give you just a few seconds. So if oh, you can just swipe that way and get to the camera. All right. So if I click, will it go to the poll? All right. So what does everyone think? So if I click again, it does not. All right. Well. I will tell you anyway. So the uh, <laughs> the uh, in the northern hemisphere, um, the ideal solar orientation for a rectangular building is east to west. So it's putting the long end of the building facing south, and that really is like North America and above. You know the Tropic of it's Cancer up here. I think yeah, Tropic of Cancer. And that is primarily because when you think about the solar path, um, the, the path that the sun takes during the day, um, the building gets more direct sun on the east and west as it's coming up and setting. And so um, what that does is you have really direct sun on those faces and it heats up your building a lot faster. As the sun gets higher, the sun is, in a little bit more indirect it's coming uh, at a shower angle so things like deep porches uh, you know to help shade the building um, are really advantageous to um, that south side uh, and then on the north you never actually get direct sun but you always get indirect sun so here we are on our site um, you'll notice it is not actually facing east west um, and that is because we had a variety of site constraints that led us to this north-south orientation. Um, uh, for instance, blocking the view of the chiller plant from the road. We have ambulances that are coming uh, to the building. And so you really wanna hide those from the street. Um, and then also needing to maintain service access to the chillers and also to the back of the dining area. Um, so all of that led us to this orientation. That is really big on this screen. So um, uh, our mechanical engineering team who you met in the last lecture helped us out with some uh, uh, solar studies. So given that we are in a 
less than ideal orientation, what can we do to actually mitigate that? So you can, you can see here's the little footprint of our building and the path that the sun takes um, when it's higher in the sun, uh, higher in the sky, that's more summer, lower in the sky is winter. Okay, so next quiz. What do you think are the best strategies to keep your building cool? Select all options that apply. And I'm just gonna click through because it's apparently not gonna work anyway. Didn't think so. Uh, it was everything but build it at night. <laughs> so there are a variety of strategies that we showed like uh, deep porches, uh, sun shading devices, and just building the wall well. Uh, these are snippets from the uh, glazing study that the mechanical engineer did. So uh, what they did was they were able to help us create a calculator where you can push and pull uh, different categories and uh, so that way we can test um, uh, the performance, uh, what will give us the biggest bang for our buck. Is it the performance of the glazing? So that is, um, you know, trying to find the best uh, solar heat gain co coefficient. Um, right there, you might want to remember that. Um, as well as the uh, depth and spacing of those vertical sunshades. Uh, so here you can see actually like the performance testing 24 inch deep fins at 45 degrees, 30 uh, inch fins also at 45 degrees, but we also did, you know, 30 degrees from the wall, 20 degrees from the wall, um, various options. Um, this is no longer working. I think you click something and now the clicker's yeah. not working. There we go. So uh, once we um, uh, did all of that math and all of those studies and, and we found the most optimal uh, sun shading plan, uh, we were able to actually take it to the drawings and we worked with the manufacturer uh, who's doing all of the curtain walls uh, and glazing and metal panels and come up with a detail that is buildable and uh, also the real challenge is having real copper and we can talk about that um, afterward if you're interested why real copper is an added challenge. Clicking. I think if you click out. I do, yeah. If I click out. Oops, back. Messes okay, there we go. So. Um, was this you or still me? Okay. <laughs> um, and then we also mentioned deep overhangs. If you look at houses in Florida, you know, the deep south, there's a reason why wraparound porches are so popular. It's another way that you can shade the building and you keep the uh, sun from actually hitting it and warming up the building. Uh, Vanessa will talk about it uh, uh, a little bit later in a little bit more layman's terms, but thinking of it like, you know, a baseball cap and keeping the sun off your face. Um, and so here we're just picturing that deep overhang um, at the southeast, southwest corner of the building from the rendering, and then the actual detail uh, near there. Okay, so moving on. What do you think the most important part of a wall is? Select all that apply. Does not matter, it's all of them. <laughs> okay. So, um, talked about the shading devices and such and now we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the third part which is the we call them the opaque walls so uh, in this case uh, well I guess walls in part in, in general but opaque and curtain walls so we got 
um, curtain walls, uh, which is glass emollients. Uh, the systems work together. They most of the your insulating, I guess, value comes actually from the glass. The emollients are actually a little bit of the weak weak link uh, in the system, but you need them to hold the glass in. Um, you have to worry about things like reflection and uh, you know keeping keeping the sun out, but also uh, let you know be able to see out. So that's the visible transmission. So all those factors lead you down the path of selecting the right kind of glass, uh, you know, so that you can um, see from the inside, let a certain amount of sun in, uh, but keep most of the heat out, um, especially down south in Florida and places like that. It's obviously in reverse in, in colder climates. Um, and then we get into opaque walls, which by definition, obviously, you can't see through. So. Um, they usually act as a rain screen. So typically when you see a brick building, uh, the brick itself is also is a, is a rain screen. It keeps most of the, the weather, the rain out, um, but there's barriers behind it that actually do um, sort of the final work of keeping the building dry. So on the wellness center, we have two types of opaque walls. Basically we have a, a brick cavity uh, wall and a metal panel wall. But in these diagrams, we kind of line them up for you so you can see that uh, the layering is, is similar across both, that you have uh, a screen on the outside, whether it's a brick or a metal panel, and insulation um, that keeps the, you know, the thermal performance of the building, and then a, a vapor barrier um, layer, which can sometimes be on the inside of the, of the insulation or on the outside, depending on the system. But that is the final sort of uh, layer that keeps the building dry uh, from the, you know, from the environment from the outside. And then the roof, the roof actually acts in a very similar way, right? It, it, you're keeping a, uh, you want to keep the weather out. Um, so the layers are slightly different than the wall because your membrane on, that's on the outside is doing most of the work. Uh, it, it doesn't have that, you don't, have that final layer on the inside, uh, then you have insulation. Um, there's a couple other layers that have to do with the way you construct it, whether it's, there's concrete or not. In this image, we don't have concrete on our metal deck, so that there's a vapor barrier to keep that in, in check. Um, and then as far as the um, roofing membranes themselves, uh, we want to keep a light roof. Um, that's actually very important to keep uh, the sun reflecting um, more up to the sky. Um, if you wear light clothes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wear, you know, dark clothes and you stand out in the sun, you get hot faster than if you wear light clothes. Um, and then looking at this too. Um, uh, the reason why that's important and but you know besides keeping your building cool um, when you look at it from a macro perspective and look at multiple buildings uh, all together if they are reflecting a whole lot of heat it contributes to the heat island effect so you if you go and visit an area that has more vegetation uh, a little bit more rural you'll notice that it's a lot cooler um, than it is in the cities because you have concrete, you have dark roofs, you have a lot of uh, materials and cars and a variety of um, aspects that are contributing to that heat island effect. So are there any questions for the USF team? I mean, sorry, not USF, the <laughs> wellness all, team. Yeah, all yeah you're all USF. <laughs> So we are talking, so, okay. <laughs> so if you're designing for Florida, so uh, you got to think about um, your buildings and whether they are, the design of it is driven by your heating degree days. So you need to, it's colder outside and you are spending more days of the year bringing it up to livable temperature, or if it's driven by cooling degree days and you're trying to 
uh, you know, it's hotter outside and you're cooling it. So down here, obviously it's driven by needing to stay cool. Um, if you are in colder climates, then obviously uh, how you design the wall system as well as um, your openings, like how many openings you have and colors are gonna be completely different because you'll want the building to retain its heat. Okay. Anything online in the chat? All right, I think Vanessa's next. So Vanessa, you're up. Do you want to present or do you want us to just click slides as you go? Either way, whichever is more convenient. If you've got it up and it's easier for you to click, you're welcome to Steve. We've we've got it up. We can. All right. We can. All right. All right. OK. So my name is Vanessa Hostick. As Steve mentioned earlier, I'm a, an architect and sustainability leader for the HOK group. Uh, I sit a lot with the sports and athletics teams. So you know we have a very interesting approach. It's it's very different than the other two buildings we'll talk about today because in some ways it's a, a very large building. Uh, in others, it's very simple. It's one big room, which is kind of exciting. Uh, the challenge is it's one really, really big room because, well, I have a whole football field inside. Uh, it's over on the very far east side of athletics campus. Um, it's over where the existing practice fields are and we're we've already got structure up. You guys can uh, you can start to see just how big it is already. Go next slide. So when we're talking about what do we do with this exterior wall of the building? Um, you know, the question always is what what is the purpose? Is it because it's the way it looks? Uh, is it because we want to control how hot or cold it is inside versus outside? Does it have to do with the waterproofing? Um, does it have to do with bringing in daylight or occupant wellness? And the answer is it's it's really all of the above. Um, we're, we have to think about all of those in addition to cost, constructability, and schedule. So next slide. Maybe next slide. Sorry. You're all right. So this gives you an idea of how big it is. Uh, it is a full size practice field inside the building. That's not as common in Division I uh, athletics. You know, there's a lot of teams that opt to go with a smaller field. It's a little more affordable, um, but you know, the university really wanted to make sure that its athletes had a full field to practice on. Uh, it makes them very competitive. And so the, the goal was, how do you put a building over the top of that? And then how do you deal with this building in a way that feels more of a human scale because it is so big? Next slide, please. So the goal was to break down the outside of the building into human scaled datums. So you have that first occupied uh, range there between about zero and 12 feet, and we wanted to use a different material, have a very distinct line so that as you walk along that facade, it doesn't feel like you're walking along a 30, 40 foot wall, which is what it really is, because that can be really uncomfortable. It breaks it up and it doesn't make it feel quite as monolithic. And then bringing in and introducing some roof lines and some shading near that front door to bring down the scale of the building and make it feel a little more welcoming. So next slide, please. And that shows you those two datums. So looking at that material change within that human occupied space, as well as that awning that sort of draws you into the entrance of the building on the southeast corner. Next slide. And this kind of gives you a feel for um, what it's going to be like when it finally gets built. So this is on the public side. This is over by the existing parking lot, and this brings that scale down for everyone as they're walking along the building, as they're approaching the building. It's a little less intimidating, and it brings you into that lobby. Uh, the only glass we really have is here at the lobby, and we make sure to shade that to keep the sun out of it. It keeps it a little cooler. It's easier to control, helps deal with glare, uh, and then brings you into that building and gives you sort of a transition space before you go into the really big open practice field part. Next slide, please. This gives you a nice clean, clean image. 
on the actual practice field side, we weren't as worried about changing or stepping down that human scale because for the most part, this is your student athletes running in and out of the building. Uh, they're kind of used to that scale. Um, they've got other things on their mind, like trying not to get run over by the senior linebacker. So they're not as worried about how the building feels right now as much as not getting run over. So it's we weren't as concerned with the scale on this side. We just want to make sure the building was functional. Next slide, please. Well, and football players are bigger too. Th this is true. We actually have bigger doors. Uh, we do not use a standard door on these buildings. We use a four foot door and an eight foot tall because when your uh, tight end in full pads comes through, he's actually eight feet tall. And yes, they wear the helmets, but it shouldn't be to get through the doorway. So we do have larger doors. Uh, they're also for the carts and God forbid a stretcher that might need to go through on occasion. We do have larger size doors in these facilities and those double doors we prop open because uh, they cannot resist the urge to smack the door on the way through. So we give it a little more opening and a little more protection. And then we have a pretty uh, limited palette on the building. We're going with insulated metal panels as our primary material. That's because they're lightweight. They're uh, an all in one package for what we're doing. They're a little more flexible and uh, they are repetitive. So it's very easy and quick to construct them. We partnered that with a polycarbonate instead of glass for most of the building. Glass is heavy, expensive, and it lets in a lot of clear direct light, which we don't want in the practice field. So we went with what's a translucent polycarbonate panel. It's the same thickness as our insulated metal panel, but it's more of a semi-transparent plastic style assembly that allows a really diffuse light that we'll talk about in a minute. And then we do have a small standard building on the side that for scale there, uh, and that has our restrooms, our offices, our lobby, and our meeting spaces. So we do have a small normal building attached to our very large football field building, and it has the standard brick and glass assembly. So daylight was a really important driver in the design of this building. We wanted to make sure that the athletes could come in and condition without ever turning on the lights, and we didn't have to worry about uh, who has access to which lighting controls. Uh, we also want to make sure it was an even diffuse daylight because that's really important for the student athlete wellness, having that introduction of light, but keeping out that heat. We also have the added complication that the Florida Energy Code requires any space over 2,500 square feet has to have a skylight. Typically, that's a great idea, but since ours is one big field, our problem was the type of building we were doing was a pre-engineered metal building, meaning we went directly to an engineered building contractor and said, what is your standard sizing right now and how fast can we get it? The minute we introduced skylights, we had a maintenance issue that had the university concerned. We had a potential leak issue and it became a custom roof, which was really expensive and it added to the timeline. So we ran a few daylighting studies and said, well, yes, the skylight on the far right did perform the best. However, we could achieve the same diffuse daylighting across the field with a clear story. And that just means that that top bit of the wall right under the roof all the way around is that translucent panel that lets in a diffuse daylight. It was also important to have a diffuse daylight. We don't like clear glass because it's high contrast and it causes glare. And glare is uh, not just annoying and a nuisance for the players. It's actually a little bit dangerous. Uh, if you can imagine being the freshman kick returner and you look up to find the ball and it, the, sun, the sun blinds you, you can no longer see all the defensive backs running at you. Now, in my mind, that might be a blessing, uh, but the athletes assure me that's actually even worse. So it's a bad thing, uh, even though they're going to chase you all the way around the field. The goal is to prevent those glare and those hot spots. Um, those are sometimes an issue in a real life game situation, but they can actually practice that outside. The goal of the interior of this facility is to create a controlled and safe environment so they can build the skills and the confidence they need to play. So we want to make sure we don't have glare and hot spots and high heat areas. Uh, we wanted that really diffuse glow and we could achieve it with that clear story lighting all the way around. Um, the central option that we ran was just on the ends. This was a cost option. This was the um, you know, what happens if we just do it on the ends? Can we get enough? We knew that was unlikely to work. That was the least effective of the three options. Our goal was that nice, even diffuse area. And this got us 30 foot candles, which is enough to practice without any additional lighting. The only time they have to turn on extra light is if they're doing any broadcasting or film. And those are pretty infrequent. So we were we were really happy with the way this settled out. Next slide. Right, this gives you a feel for the way it is inside. It's a big building. You got to be able to, to kick and punt the ball. 
um, we went ahead and broke down those datums on the inside as well. So you'll see the crash pads go up to that 12 foot mark. You have the graphics that go up to the bottom of the polycarbonate um, for the daylighting and that polycarbonate rounds it out up against the roof. So it's in that clear set of datums. It breaks the building up so it doesn't feel quite so monolithic uh, or intimidating. Next slide. This just gives you an idea of what's going to look like on the inside. Nice big open space. All right, so we'll talk a little bit here about the exterior wall system to close out. There are sort of two types of wall systems you see, and most of the um, ones you're going to talk about today, everybody's going to do a rain screen, and that's because it has what's known as the two lines of defense. You're trying to keep both water and air out. You want to make sure that if it breaks through that very outside datum, which here would be the brick, that you have a backup, and that's some type of continuous drainage plane back behind. Uh, this is really important to ensure the integrity of the building. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, we call it, um, you know, you put on the, the straps, you've got all the stuff behind it. You know, this is your standard architectural system. However, it doesn't move very well. And in our case, for the pre-engineered metal building, those buildings move a lot. There's a lot of flex and sway for a building with that big of a span. It's also not a museum or a hospital or you know, even a classroom. We have a, a higher threshold of tolerance for changes in temperature uh, and for the way that building is built. We need something that's quick, that's very lightweight, um, and that's affordable. And so what we ended up doing was a single line of defense, meaning the only thing between inside and outside is that insulated metal panel. The danger you have there is that as the building moves and flexes, especially if you'd have a big storm, is those seals can break and you get water into the building. That's really dangerous if you have it on the outside of an assembly where you can't see those seals. In the case of having a single line of defense, we can always see the seals and quickly repair them. The other nice thing about a pre-engineered metal, metal building and my, my kind of favorite fun fact about our building is we don't have a floor. So whereas a normal building, you have to worry about it ruining finishes, water getting on your floor, um, potential mold. In our case, if you walk out in the middle of that field when it's done and you dump a cup of water, it's going back to mother nature. There is nothing under that field. There is no slab. It is sand, gravel, drainage, mother earth in Florida. Uh, so we're less concerned here about if something bad happens and it breaks. It's very quick and easy to reseal that system. And if you do get a little bit of water in the building, it's really not an issue for us. It's very different than the other types of buildings you'll see today because they have to worry about that indoor environment. They've got the floors, the finishes, the classrooms, the electronics. We have a big football field. It's kind of nice. We'll keep going to the next slide. So I like to describe the two different types of walls, and this is so unfortunate for all of you that I watched the Olympics when I was putting this together. So all illustrations from this point forward are based on the Olympics. Uh, your standard two line of defense assembly is really similar to what you see those um, long term outdoor athletes wearing. It has to do, it's a little bit more like the snowboarders. You have that outer shell, that waterproof layer, like your brick layer. You have your insulating layer underneath of it. Um, that's what you're using to keep it warm, or in this case, to keep the heat out. It's very similar to the insulation in the wall. And then you have that base layer, that moisture wicking, that final interior layer you wear for comfort. And that's really that interior wall design. So very similar to the way you would dress to go out in the elements. That's how we design a building wall. That would be a traditional assembly. But for the pre-engineered metal building, well, and this gives you an idea of we do have that on our building. But the pre-engineered metal building is more like what the um, high speed performance athletes wear, like the alpine skiers, the speed skaters. It's that single high performance outfit. It's meant for you to move. It's meant for um, sort of short term, not necessarily short term life, but short term exposure because no one's sitting in a, at a desk all day today um, in this building. We aren't as concerned about that environment. We're concerned about movement and performance and keeping people going. So that's your, your big difference between those two. And that is what the bulk of the building is made of, is that pre-engineered system with that single skin. And the last thing we did was we did study that system to make sure we were not going to have condensation issues. Our big concern is the way the structure has to be attached to that, that you create a thermal bridge. And we wanted to make sure that as it got really hot or really cold outside, that that indoor temperature, we were not gonna have water condense and run down the inside face of that building. 
and that is actually one of the things that creates mold growth. So we were very concerned. We did run the whole system and confirm that that was not going to be a problem, but that was something we ran early on when we were making the decision to go with that single skin system to make sure it would still perform and protect the integrity of the building. That should be it. Our last close out question here is the advantage of the metal panel system. Is it because it's lightweight because it's got that integrated finish that it's thermal performance and it's fast assembly and it's, it's definitely all the above. All right, any questions? So Vanessa, I did bring a, a sample of the metal panel uh, awesome. system here. So here. Here's here is a sample if I can do it with three hands. So you've got the the outside metal metal skin. You've got an inside metal skin and then it's just foam in the middle. Yeah. And as Vanessa was saying, you know, these, these things do can move a little bit as the as the wind blows. Um, and that's that's basically how you how you fit them together. There is yep. a there's a seal in between there. It actually creates the waterproof seal, and you know if it does break, you can always come in and and address it. Yep. So it'll be here after the class if anybody wants to come in and poke it or play with it or whatever. So, um, any other questions? Yes, sir. No, it's actually so. So the question was with the metal panels, is it just kind of sitting there um, against the metal building? No. So so what you see out there right now, if you go out there, you see the big arches um, that, that create the structure. And then about every four feet is a what's called a Z purlin Z because it's shaped like a Z. It's really technical, um, but those the metal panels were actually fastened to those Z panels every every four feet or so. And that's what yeah. that's what connects it to the to the metal building. They have a series of hidden fasteners that go through. So if you grab that sample inside one of those little key pieces that sticks up is you fasten through there to the purlin and that's what holds it up. And then you do those every so many feet and those metal panel, they are fairly rigid. They come in about 12 foot lengths. They're bigger than you think. Uh, they show up in very so large pieces. Screw right there. And then you're able to seal between those as you key them together. Yeah. Okay, good question. Yeah. Any other questions for the for the metal panel system? Or the single skin, double skin? All right. And here we're going to head it over to hand it over to Marcel and Ed and who else? We got Mike and Chris and Eric and Kat. So there you go. All right, so um, I have to hold it close to my <laughs> left hand. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Honors College, which I believe it's where your building will be. Um, I guess the questions are first. Um, so the first question, how can a design reduce the urban heat island effects? Select all options that apply. Darker colored materials, less pavements, incorporate green roof design, use reflective color materials. I think it doesn't work, right? Yeah. So by show of hands, who says, hey, since it doesn't work, the poll? <laughs> no? Who says B? And who says C? And who says D? Let's. <laughs> um, the question the reduced urban heat island effect so the 
I think uh, it was Carrie, right? So you touched base a little bit on the colors, so the dog, dog colored materials. It's not the best option. All the other options are good, and we're going to talk especially about the reflective colored materials. Does that work? Okay. Uh, the color shift effect of the facade coating is caused by. So I guess you're going to have to guess on this one. <laughs> Ambient temperature, view angle, angle of incident lights. And that's about, no, we're going to talk about more details on that. Maybe we can do the questions after instead. Let's go back to the questions. I'm going to wear there first. All right, so um, just to give you an update, and this photo is already outdated, um, but right now, uh, they're putting the metal panels up on the skin. And um, just to give you an idea of timelines here on this building, and you probably covered that before, but we started the design on this early 2018, and it's 2022 right now in the middle of construction. And I think it's early 2023, right? So end of construction. So, so you have a good five year span there uh, from the first pen on paper all the way to the end of construction. And that has to do with the um, the size of the building, uh, but also the complexity of the building. You know, uh, when we started this, it was clear that it had to be a signature building, uh, really a landmark for USF and the Honors College, uh, really showcasing uh, the Honors College to the rest of the world, where you, and also providing this, this transformative uh, educational place uh, at USF, but being able to showcase that um, outside. Um, and the big thing was also connecting uh, the Honors College to the rest of the campus and community. So uh, I think everybody's been to the side, right? And seen the renderings, but the, is this a pointer? I don't know. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is the first two levels are very open and transparent. So we're going to see a lot of glass. Um, really inviting the community in the, to the building. And as they enter the building, they greet it with the uh, six story atrium. Uh, will they be able to see the Honors College in action? Uh, the rest of the building is clad with a metal panel system, which uh, Ed will talk in more detail, and the rest of the team. Um, but the idea is the, the Honors College is inside this, this more um, opaque metal panels. Um, and you can see here that they started, uh, oops, the putting the panels from the no southeast corner and working their way around the building. Um, as you get into the southeast corner, the metal panel actually comes down into the ground because this is the back of house spaces. Uh, so we don't want to put glass to look into uh, bathrooms or um, plumbing rooms. Nothing exciting there. So that comes down. This is you know the back of house delivery. We still dress it up with the metal panels. Um, but you'll notice the, the glazing is very controlled for natural lights. Um, there's, I mean, views to the outside. There's a quick video. And they're moving really fast on, on inside those mega panels. So probably the coolest thing about this building is the color shifting. Um, paints, color, the iridescent paints uh, finish. Uh, so as you move around the building, it changes color, but also the building curves in two directions on every side. Um, so it provides that that effect uh, on on all sides. And there's a couple of moments on the building where we provide some relief uh, with glass on the north and south. Um, oh, no, I'm pressing the wrong. North and south, and also the east side uh, to provide more glazing. And in addition to the color changing, it also helps with um, uh, the thermal envelope of the building. Uh, so Ed, who's in New York, um, will get into more details. Yeah, thank you, Marcel. Uh, my name is Ed Kwong from Offices Architects. Um, there are always two objectives when we design the Honest College. Um, 
first is really to give an iconic uh, landmark uh, presence uh, on the campus and also to create a very dynamic facade. Uh, it really draw like students and faculty into the building and, and also the, be the building become the focal point of the campus. And secondly, we always think a lot about uh, sustainability and performance of the building. And and you know you can see like my my uh, upcom upcoming presentation will be oscillating between aesthetic and performance. Uh, in this case of the color shifting coding, uh, it's actually quite innovative. Uh, first, it shift colors. Uh, that's quite appealing. Um, Marcel, will you go to the next slide? And the color shifting is really made by like all these multi-layer flakes. Uh, that is like really tiny. Uh, we are talking about like 40 million of an inch, uh, around like 115 uh, of an inch. Uh, uh, sorry, around 115 of like a thickness of a hair. So we are talking about like this multi flakes um, that is created within the pigment structure that change color. When you think about it, it's similar to the iridescent color from pearl or butterflies. Uh, and, and if you go out to the site, you can actually observe that effect. And, and really the color shifting is based on two factors. Uh, one is the angle at which it is viewed. And then the other is the angle of the incident light um, hitting on the panel. Uh, and the interesting thing I want to kind of talk about is the, when we look at the building sample, uh, uh, it's, it looks very different than, than the actual application of this building uh, in, in this scale. Uh, and, and the facade actually look a lot more dynamic and interactive uh, with the scale. Uh, next slide, please. And the other benefit of uh, uh, the coding is uh, it actually cools the environment. Uh, Carrie and Marcel touch on the urban island effect, uh, which is, uh, you know, as we know, the, the global temperature rising, uh, 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 we can we can really felt it uh, in the urban area where we have a lot of concrete, a lot of dark building material, uh, and and it really uh, affect the the microclimate of of, of the city, uh, and and you will see from the diagram the city is actually a lot hotter than the rural area. Um, interestingly, um, this coding uh, because of the chemistry of the coding, it actually really reflects like. Uh, when you look at the coding, it's very dark in color, uh, but you know, in contrast, uh, they they actually reflect heat away from the building, um, and that's why we picked this uh, uh, coding. Uh, it actually helped uh, to have a lot of energy saving uh, without uh, compromise on colors. Uh, next slide, please. And we see sustainable design as an integral aspect of our architecture. Um, and daylighting plays an important role uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Um, the more effective the daylighting uh, means we can reduce the overall energy use in the building, uh, making the building as sustainable as possible. Next slide. And, and the unique thing about this facade is the, the veil, the metal skin. Uh, on one hand, uh, we always uh, think about the metal skin is performative. But on the other hand, uh, it's an artifact that is much more connected to the aesthetic uh, formal exercise uh, for our office. As you can see, this metal skin uh, in the rendering is wrapping around the building corner and it gives us a lot of freedom from the norm of a window curtain wall and the whole notion of facade. And we have this continuous service that allow us to make architecture open or close, uh, control lights, capture views, and mitigate environment, environmental conditions. Um, as you can see this slides, um, so you can see uh, building in Florida is actually challenging uh, with excessive solar heat gain. Um, and you can see our, our daylighting designer actually look at the solar angle uh, coming into the building through different seasons. Um, and we actually use this angle to precisely control the glare uh, and, and daylighting. And the sun control um, actually help us to reduce the heat gain uh, and cooling requirements of the building. Um, next slide, please. 
And then you can see that it's a, a large exterior covered terrace space uh, is located on the second floor along the building west elevation. Uh, to make this space uh, more usable because you get a lot of west exposure, uh, a shading screen is installed over this exterior space. And in the final space, you will see also this like big fan uh, above uh, the exterior space. And, and this will serve as an outdoor meeting uh, space that can be accessed from the interior and the exterior. Next slide, please. And then what you're seeing is a mock-up uh, veil that we did at McGrath's factory. Uh, we often use an like, advanced 3D software platform to develop all this complex uh, facade system. And often they are calibrated uh, to conserve like material costs, uh, balance shading and views, uh, and allow for UC constructability. Next slide, please. And this one is the video uh, flying through uh, what is currently being installed. Uh, and, and Honest College is a project that requires a lot of thinking on the performance uh, using openings, the scheme uh, to take advantage of natural light and the exterior temperature conditions. Next slide. As you can see in this slide uh, showing the construction of the bell, the green part, and the glass curtain wall. And this exterior screen is the most effective way to deal with solar heat gain. Uh, because this is on the west side, uh, we are trying to cut down all the solar energy before it enters to the space. Uh, because once the heat gain has passed through the glazing, uh, it becomes very difficult to reflect it back down. So that's why this uh, green uh, screening element uh, is very effective to block and, and reduce uh, uh, the building uh, heat gain uh, from the exterior condition. Next slide, please. And then in this slide, we are seeing the south facade, the solar angle, uh, and we located a bunch of private offices uh, in on the south side. And then the, the external, uh, shading system uh, is to use to moderate light at the window uh, so that it can actually decrease the contrast of uh, daylight and coming into the space, the light become more diffuse. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will you will kind of see how how it looks from the interior point of view. Um, and we all love to have access to natural daylight and and also like a view to the outside. And, and using this exterior shading device where you can see in the red circle, it really kind of cut down the glare and reduced the contrast ratio uh, between like bright daylight and the view. Uh, and and I, I think like you can kind of see the tree lines is actually aligned to the shading device uh, and, and it kind of cut away most of the glare uh, from the sky. Um, and it really create a very comfortable space. And also you're letting in like a really good quality daylighting uh, and, and eventually it helps you in terms of like, you know, uh, your, your artificial lighting. Uh, you can actually reduce the amount of artificial light you use in the space. Um, and in the, in the next uh, uh, topic, I'm going to hand it over to Chris Clater from uh, back and he's going to talk about the delivery of this project. Is Mike McGrath on by chance? All right. Well, in that case, there's bad news, good news situation. Bad news is I've not spoken to both of you. I was just saying you guys are in for a treat. Um, bad news is I'm not the person who's supposed to be presenting this. The good news is it means I'm not going to be talking about thermal performance or heat island effects. Um, the thing that was unique about Honors College in terms of the project delivery was a what we call a design assist effort specific for the facade system. So you can see up on the screen here, this is traditional design construction, design, bid, build, right? In this scenario, the owner contracts with the contractor, the owner contracts with the design team, the design team sometimes talks to the contractor who sometimes relays that information back to the owner and it's just this giant wasteful loop. 
And in this giant gray area right here, you waste time, you waste money, and you waste a whole lot of sanity. It's not fun for anybody. So, we just kind of merge things. It seems fairly simplistic from a concept standpoint, not so simplistic from an execution standpoint. So, there's a couple different ways you can merge these efforts. You can go through a traditional design build effort, right, in which the design and construction is housed under a single entity. We're not that. So we decided to go the hard way, uh, or we'll say more complex way, and still contract separately with USF, but really merge the efforts together early on in the design process. So effectively what you're doing is you're gaining the expertise of the design team who they do this day in and day out. They're, they are experts at what they design and plan for. On the construction side, people like MG McGrath are experts at what they actually construct. So you are merging constructability and other considerations that can be very important to a project such as schedule and money, right? So when you start looping in all of these, what we'll call back end items, which are traditionally done during construction or figured out during bidding and then construction, you get this holistic approach to design of a specific thing, right? Facade, system, whatever it happens to be. That's what we did here. So we never stepped foot on the construction site until November, right? So maybe about a year and a quarter ago. We were designing this a year before that. We were involved in the design process a year before that, working through some of these finer details, working through constructability concerns, schedule concerns, and cost concerns. So in addition to building this really cool project, we want to be stewards of the university's money, right? We don't want to spend money just to spend money. We want to find the best use of the dollar. And a good example of that that you guys probably just saw was these perforated panels, right? Where can we use these perforated panels? What type of perforations can we use? Can we standardize the perforations instead of going with custom perforations? All of these things can be taken into account when you have the people who are managing the construction process and actually installing on board early to talk through all of these things. So before I get to the, this is where Mike was going to chime in, but before I get to this, um, the process works if it's done correctly. The original budget for the uh, project, this part of the project was around 7.9 million. It came in at 7.3 and we're holding to that. So it was a massive undertaking that yielded really good results. I'm gonna blow through these real quick. This is the McGrath facility in Minnesota. These things are built by hand. So there's certainly technology that goes into it, high performing equipment that goes into it, but at the end of the day, this is people making products, which is really cool. So the um, panels that we have out there are unitized panels with, we'll call them face, paneling on top of it, right? So everything gets locked into each other on top and it stacks up. So basically this unit goes from bottom up, right to left as it goes up the building. CNC machine, I won't quiz you on what CNC means because half the time I forget it myself, but it's basically a machine that does very precise and accurate cuts. That's how they fab these uh, metal pieces that get attached onto these unitized insulated panels. And we're running short. Mike's not here, so he loses out. There we go. Who's up on? Eric and Kat. Yes, yes. Thank you. So my name is Kat Chan, and I'm with Walking More. Eric and I are enclosure consultants, and generally our role in projects, we're kind of imagining, you know, imagine us as trusted advisors for the design team. So we bring together performance criteria, usually sometimes it's above and beyond code, or we have a very specific project function. For us in this academic building and for sustainability, we had to look at construction and feasibility and how things are going to come together. Oh dear, so I'm just going to keep talking. So a traditional facade, uh, you can think of, you know, the, the structure is there and you have to cover it in some way to protect the structure. This is a concept we've talked about a lot today. And all over here on the left, 
is a window wall system where you cover the slab edges and then you put the glazing in. So it's a two part system and you can see that they basically stack you up the building. Now on the right here, we have a curtain wall system, which is an entire panel that includes both the slab cover and the glazing. If we can go to the next slide, I'm going to now talk a touch about how these different approaches of a stick system, which is kind of what a window wall system is, what the efficiencies are there. So a stick system is slightly more old fashioned, but it's still tried and true, it still works, but you have to install the sticks first and then the glazing panels. So you basically have to put things one by one. It's a little bit more labor intensive and the quality of the workmanship is intimately tied to the performance of the facade that you'll get. Now the unitized system on the right over here, that all of that finicky interfaces, those are all done in shop. So those panels arrive and they're put into place. So you can see, you can imagine it there being quite a bit of efficiency in that all of the hard work is done in shop. If we go to the following slide, I'm going to touch a little bit about the stick built system as it applies to an opaque system. So similarly to the other two projects we've seen today, we've talked about different layers and their performances. As you can imagine, each layer has to be applied separately. And in the, in the uh, idea of different trades, so folks doing different layers of the facade, you can imagine that being a scheduling and workmanship challenge. And that's the traditional way that facades have been put together and it works just fine. However, for this project, considering the geometry and considering our want for innovative approaches and potentially some cost savings, we looked at unitizing our approach for the opaque systems. So if we can go to the following slide, this is an example of actually one of Ed's previous projects that you can see those elements individually going in. Ed, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, so this one is a project uh, in upstate New York. And as you can see, uh, literally it's uh, building stake by stake. Uh, and and this, it, it has a lot of challenge on site uh, because of the climate. Uh, uh, these people has to work in like sub-zero condition at some time, like in the New York upstate, and and that's why uh, in in this case in Florida we we select a, a mega panel system because of the ease of install and and it helps our client on, and the schedule. So if we can go to the following slide, you'll see that someone is in a in a pl lifted platform and applying sealant. So each line of those sealants, each stud that you see there is put in by hand. And so labor intensive, also extremely weather dependent. You know, nor upstate New York, we've got snow and we've got ice, but in Florida, you can imagine hurricanes, rain, you wouldn't want to be doing this during those inclement weather situations. So if we go to the following image, the following slide is our project. So basically that sandwich of exterior face panel, the insulation, those images that we saw from a gas fabrication plant, all that's already ready to go. And instead of this approach, we're stacking them all together. So if you go to the following slide, thanks Marcel, you can see those panels getting lifted. So it's the same idea as those unitized curtain wall panels, but now it also has all the opaque materials there too. If you can go to the following slide, I'm going to hand it over to Eric, who's going to talk about uh, visual mockups and perform mockups with Ed. But yeah, you can see this getting lifted. So it's really cool because you can see that Basically, the frames fit in together. So similarities to the insulated metal panel in the previous project, those gaskets come around and provide for you all of that, that uh, performance against weather, wind, air infiltration. You want to go to the next slide? There we go. And do you want to kick it off talking about the visual mockup? Yeah, so this one is one of the first mockup that we did for the facade, and this one is called visual mockup. Uh, and the goal for this mockup is to look at color finishes and detailing uh, of the facade. So it's mostly on the architectural side of things that we review in this mockup. And and I always say like, kind of uh, uh, you know bring up a, a point for for facade mockup uh, even like just for architectural mockup is very different than like a product uh, iPhone prototyping uh, you know like for example iPhone you can spend like uh, hundreds of million to to work on a prototype uh, because like the the product will be copied like five million times. 
Uh, but our building is very different. Uh, usually we just like build uh, the same building once uh, in this site uh, for Honors College. Uh, so that's why the, the trust that we can actually spend on the markup uh, in terms of the proportion of the cost that we spend on the markup is very different. Um, but, but we use this opportunity to really look at uh, uh, the facade uh, full scale uh, and, and really review all the details. And at the end, uh, after this process, uh, we go on to the second mockup that Eric is going to talk about, which is the performance mockup. Great, thanks, Ed. So, Let's go to the so next. Guys, just just a heads up, we've got about three minutes left. Sure, I'll go as fast as I can. <laughs> so if we go to the next two slides, um, you know, Kat mentioned that um, as as uh, envelope consultants, we are. Uh, responsible for defining, uh, helping define the performance criteria. That's like all the environmental factors that this this facade will will witness over the course of its life. And as such, we build these mockups called performance mockups that really simulate what that facade is be experiencing from an air perspective, from a wind perspective, from a from a water perspective, right? And what we do is we we uh, build a large section of of uh, of the facade, um, usually over multiple floors and multiple bays wide, and then we we expose it to a bunch of different pressures, which is which is air, which is water, and we're using stuff like this big propeller fan to sort of spray water and blow water at very high speeds to make sure that the facade is not leaking, right? To make sure that this custom system that that you know we've worked together with McGrath to develop um, is not leaking. And then we also simulate how the building moves, right? The building structure always moves with wind or 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 just ground movement. Um, and we use these these jacks on the inside to, to move the building, to move the facade up and down, left and right. And then we test it again after it's been moved to see again if there's any issues with air leakage or water leakage. And then finally, we want to understand the, the impact of of uh, of the thermal uh, performance. So what we do is um, we put a big insulated chamber around the, the, the mock-up and then we expose it to, to heat and cold and we look for issues like condensation. We look for, um, we track heat transfer through the, through, the, through the elements. And then once we do, and we, and we look at how this facade expands and contracts as a result of heat. And then once that's done, it's tested once again to see if anything has sort of been compromised as a result of kind of the natural expansion and contraction of the materials. And then finally, you know, over the course of a building, it's inevitable that um, a piece of glass may break, right? And so what we do often is uh, a reglazing test. So it's basically taking out a broken piece of glass and then replacing it. So we're making sure that it can be done easy on the site um, and that there's no, um, there's nothing preventing us in the design uh, from, from replacing a glass very, very, uh, very easily. That's it. All right. Thank you, Eric and Kat and Ed and Vanessa online. Um, so obviously three different buildings, very different skins, but they're all got metal skins on them. A uh, single, a single layer, double layer with the rain screen, double layer with the, a sunscreen, really remote. What kind of questions do we, do we have wrapping up here? You're still awake, so that's a good thing. All right, I think that's it. Thank you all very much. Hopefully you absorbed a little bit, but that's uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of really good information. Thank you guys for coming in town. You guys are here all the time. Uh, but thank you all very much.